just lost my Q&A. Welcome everybody to webinar five. Unbelievable. Um, we've, we've made it through five uh, webinars. Take a moment to find your Q&A screen. None of you asked questions um, before as you registered, but as uh, we get going, hopefully uh, people will get have lots of questions uh, for our panelists. And we've got, um, well, before I go into the panelists, we have starting to line up um, all of our webinars till we give up in mid-December. Uh, so we've got coming up um, a session on revolving funds, celebrating the, uh, the success of Quorum up in the Northern Rivers region who uh, leveraged off Carina and their work um, to get their revolving fund running. We're going to talk to Warburton Community Hydro, um, one of the first run of the river hydro plants to be turned on. And we're going to talk about solar gardens. And the invitation is open to everyone. If your community energy group has news to share, contact me and let's get a webinar going and, and let's share our news. So I am very pleased to welcome um, Beyond Zero Emissions and their collaborators. So Imogen Jubb is the um, manager of the Zero Carbon Communities Program. She's going to be talking to us about that and she's been collaborating with Matt Sullivan and what they've been trying to do is get um, a, a tool working to communities and um, you may have seen in the links uh, the surveys that were sent round about how to do that and finally we're going to finish off with Michael Lord who looks at uh, the more industrial scale and, and the larger regional scale um, repowering. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to you, Imogen. Oh, you need to turn your, um, your sound on. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I've got a few slides. We run through the first slide pretty quickly. because They're really just introductions to VZE and the program, which probably quite a lot of you know already. So we'll look at um, the local government review that we did earlier this year, and then how we hope that will be used by communities to set um, the baseline emissions profile that we're working on. Um, so for the don't know, Beyond Zero Emissions is a volunteer-led climate solutions think tank, and volunteers are really important to us, about 85% Imogen, I'm just going to. Emissions just, Australia is it? Imogen, your sounds um, not coming through very well. So I just wonder, would you be able to dial in? Would that um, would that make you a lot clearer? Yeah, you sound really crackly to me. So I'm not sure. Um, right. It's just my speak very. Uh, you are Heather. You sound very clear, so I think it may be imaging connection. So, um, Imogen, if you if you can press near the telephone on your system and and um, attempt to go through the dial in, and maybe we'll we'll keep moving through some of these slides as as um, we try to get you on better sound. Do you think that will work? Uh, I might head over to Michael because he can do the intro to BZD just as well as I can and I'll see if I can dial in. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, can, can we just go I can't, I'm not sure if we finished the last screen. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Sound good. absolutely. Excellent. Um, yeah, can we just go to the last one? Yeah, so we're, we're volunteer led, very few staff, but uh, we're very lucky to have a lot of volunteers that do a, a, most of our work. In fact. Um, and we're, we're engaged in showing that really eliminating emissions isn't that difficult. Uh, more specifically, that we've got the technologies to el eliminate emissions and that we can do that um, in 10 years. That's achievable. Quite detailed research showing how in each sector uh, emissions can be eliminated. 
and then on the basis of that research we do a lot of advocacy and um and of course we do um we work with communities as well which Imogen's going to talk about we hope uh and uh, we got there oh we won an international award recently uh, for best international ng and environment think tank um so yeah the motivations probably most people on the uh, the call will um uh, agree with this that the motivations that we're, we're facing uh, uh, an impending disaster and our, our role in it we're not campaigners but our role is really researchers and um, uh, um, providing information to the rest of the climate movement and everyone uh, that the technologies are there you know the technologies we kind of show that the technologies are there in order to show they're not the issue. Once we know the technologies are there, we know that the issue must be with the politics uh, and and some other issues because the the politics will and the the technologies enable us to eliminate emissions. Uh, let's see what's on the next slide. Um, yes, uh, so we we look at uh, all sectors, and this is true both for our research and for zero carbon communities program so in most of this in all of the sectors that produce emissions in australia the transport electricity generation buildings industry land use um, we have produced uh, a report showing how we can eliminate emissions uh, in that sector and it's it's having done that research yet yeah, there's pictures of um, many of our reports that's what we use as the basis of information when we advise communities uh, how, how they can eliminate emissions. Um, we feel we've, we've done 12 years of research and uh, we've, we have a good understanding of a wide range of solutions, uh, whatever the situation of different communities. And there's some really good detailed work there and um, you know you followed the journey of uh, Port Augusta who've recently had a win and none of that would have happened without that early work that you did on on solar thermal power. Yeah yeah that, that, that that's a good point Heather. Um, our first report was about how we could have a hundred percent renewable electricity system and we were the first organization of any kind to show in detail how that can be done and then we drilled down to Port Augusta because they we knew that at the time there was a coal-fired power station northern power station which was going to close down since has closed down uh, and we said well let's transition the plan was let's transition smoothly into uh, concentrated solar thermal uh, Fire power station, but now that plant, uh, concentrated solar thermal, is being built. Um, thanks, you know, initially to our report and the campaign we started, but also years of campaigning by uh, a number of organisations. So that, that that's a great win for the the climate movement, I think. And um, Imogen saying she thinks she's back, which is good because uh, <laughs> this is the bit where she needs. <laughs> Can I just check? Can people hear me? Oh, you're yes. much clearer now. Thank yes. you for the right. Imogen. Okay, um, so yeah, I wasn't paying total attention then, but I think we're probably up to the zero carbon communities part. Um, so this is an initiative um, that is really happening worldwide. Um, so the Paris Agreement, I think there are now over 7,500 mayors who've signed up to the Global Covenant of Mayors around the world, and lots and lots of other towns and cities and regions around the world who are pledging 100% renewable goals and other zero emissions targets. So zero carbon communities is really one of the ways Australians can get involved and BZD is providing support and resources to communities who are looking to set a target in one or more sector to reduce emissions towards zero. And there are lots and lots of communities around Australia who are doing this kind of work. Um, we've identified over 50 communities in our Australian Local Government Review um, who've set a target of some kind or other um, towards looking towards working to zero emissions. So the Local Government Review is a piece of work we published um, I think in April earlier this year and really the purpose of it was to get a better sense of what's going on nationally in Australia at local councils um, and at local community scale and what what can we best do to support um, to support communities in that process? So we looked at 
the national picture. So we did kind of two different bits of research. One was we recruited lots of volunteers to um, do a survey of every single council website in Australia um, to answer whether they had any information about climate change, whether they provided actions that their communities could take to address climate change, whether they have strategies and plans to reduce emissions, um, and whether they have a target to reduce their corporate emissions, which is the council operations emissions, so their swimming pools, car fleets and the like, and whether they had a target to reduce community-wide emissions. And this little chart here gives the kind of national picture. So the ACTs, you know, ticks all the boxes. They're the line at the top. Um, and then the other states, uh, you can see Victoria is the green line, so they're quite a significant bar above the rest of the states. Um, and um, um, having publicly available community-wide emissions targets. So that's really one of our objectives is, is how to boost up that number. So communities and councils are working together to reduce emissions community-wide. Um, this is just a really quick slide about where people were from who responded to a survey. So this is a different bit of data that we collected, which was about 100 councils and communities around Australia who responded to a survey we put out. Um, and this is um, around those who had emissions profiles. Um, so the one on the left is whether the council had a corporate emissions profile. And so most of the councils who responded to our survey did but most of them do not have a community-wide survey. Um, and that's one of the pieces of work we'll talk about in a sec. Um, and then again, this is from the, the, the 100 or so councils who responded to our survey. 80% had a corporate target to reduce emissions, and about 35% had a target to reduce community-wide emissions. But nationally, that picture was quite different. Only 19% of councils nationally had a corporate target, and only 7% had a, um, a community-wide target. This slide is just some of the most popular actions that councils and communities were taking to reduce emissions. Um, so if you are either working in a council or um, are a community member, these are just good examples of actions that have been achieved. Um, so I encourage you to have a look at the report if that's useful to you. Um, and then we've also produced the Zero Carbon Communities Guide, which outlines a range of steps that communities can take towards reducing emissions to zero, again, in one or more sectors. And we did a pilot program on this process with three communities in Victoria last year. And we've also been involved with Zero Emissions Byron and Zero Emissions Tweed and Zero Emissions Noosa. Um, so we suggested these particular steps that communities can take and really they're not, you know, they're not really linear. They're all a kind of ongoing circular process that needs to be, you know, redone and re-engaged with all the time and that community engagement is really the heart of those, all of those steps. If your community is not engaged, you're not going to get too far. So one of the steps was about getting baseline emissions and we were thinking about how that's actually a really pretty tricky step for community groups because getting access to data is quite difficult and understanding the data is quite difficult and putting it in a format that's useful to make decisions with can be really difficult um, and you can get bogged down in the detail really easily which then distracts the limited resources of community figure out how we might be able to solve that problem. Um, and we were really lucky to get a small grant from the Lord Mayor's Charitable Fund and really lucky to work with Ironback um, who have access to a lot of this data and use it commercially for their council work. Um, and so we're now trying to find a way to make that information available to any municipality in Australia um, at free or really low cost. <coughs> um, this is just an example of some of the work we've done with other communities. So we've um, done some strategic planning with, with particular community groups around how they can get to zero emissions 
in this instance in stationary energy within 10 years. Um, and then also around how to set science-based targets for communities um, that match the scale of action required and also put the responsibility for that action, not just in council's hands, not just in community's hands, um, but you know, everyone taking, taking on a role in solving the problem. <laughs> this is also an example of some of the data we got for one of the communities we were working with, um, which is Borbor in eastern Victoria. Um, so in summary, it shows the amount of energy used, the amount of CO2 produced in a year, and roughly the amount of money spent by the community on energy in that year as well. And um, that's often a good, um, what's the word? A good um, unit to express this stuff in because everyone understands it. Not everyone understands energy usage or emissions. So we're aiming to try and translate this information into cost as well. Um, and then, so the actual profile that we're looking to create um, will be done in collaboration with Ironbark. They will be quite simple. We're not looking to produce really complicated reports, but we are interested in making them really accessible and providing that base information for communities um, that they can take to their counsellors, they can take to other people in their community and say, look, we really want to do something about this. This is what we're responsible for. What can we, what, what targets are appropriate to set, what strategies are appropriate and use it as a Kickstarter to get involved in, um, in the process towards getting to zero emissions. Now we put out a survey, which I think, are you sorry, Hannah? Are you taking um, survey answers or are you, have you wound up the survey um, now? Well, Matt will actually go through the results of the survey so far. So we've done a bit of analysis on it, but we can, um, it, it won't take much to do it again. So if you've got, if you've got burning, feel free to add your information to that link. Um, and it will help us design the survey and make it as useful to you as possible. So I might hand over to Matt because he's um, got much more technical information than I do. And we'll talk a little bit more about the survey results and making them compliant with global protocols. And, and maybe before you start, Matt, tell us a bit about Iron Bank Sustainability because many of us wouldn't have heard of you. Sure, so Iron Bank Sustainability is a consulting group that works or very much with local government. Um, we're, uh, we, we're working or have worked with 250 councils across Australia, which is roughly half of them. Uh, and so we currently work nationally. Um, there's a few areas that we work in, but essentially our key area of expertise, you know, sort of the thing that we say we do is like we're very driven about um, practical action. So um, sort of definitively realizing emissions reductions. And so that's sort of bases around like, so we get involved a lot with uh, projects such as, you know, large scale, um, uh, lighting upgrades and uh, street lighting projects and large scale building optimization type initiatives. But my involvement with the organization is around uh, bringing a much stronger numerical basis to carbon mitigation action. So trying to uh, give local government and state governments uh, much more coherent uh, numbers backed approaches. So that's kind of the work that we do. The, um, in relation to the, what I'm going to go through right now, so we've got, um, We've got, uh, I'm going to talk through the survey and the survey results uh, and sort of how we've been interpreting those results. And then I'm going to talk through um, some of the sort of the specifics of about, um, the, I guess, like the rule set, the framework of the, the profiles, and then talk about some of the opportunities presented in ways of, of, of sort of connecting those two, the desires of the community groups to the type of uh, emissions profile mapping that, that um, that this project's focused on. So uh, the first page here, so we had, we basically was circulated wide, so it's 29 responses. So essentially there's 29 different community groups that were represented in, uh, in the surveys. There's just some of the broader discussions about, um, it's largely about awareness and where things peg within the group. Um, broadly, we just see that there's actually extremely high level of interest in getting emissions type data. Um, 
Now, the second question there, have you heard of the Global Protocol for Community-Based Emissions Reporting? Sorry. Sorry. No, no, that's all right. It's just that it's one thing. So the, the Global Protocol for Community-Based Emissions Reporting, which is typically shortened to GPC, is um, the standard that's being applied. Oops. And it's uh, we're going to go through. So we can Sorry. move on to. That one there. Oh, that's okay. We'll, we'll move on to the next slide. So this slide here. So. Basically, what we were looking to do uh, in the survey was to try and get an understand by a couple of different dimensions, what were the things that um, communities were feeling would be the most influential um, data or pieces of information or sort of ways of understanding um, emissions so that we could ensure that when we design a system, we could focus on the highest priority things and then as um, either uh, time and budget permitted or as you know to look at for future iterations move on to the sort of the second and third tier options so uh, initially so uh, this particular set of questions were basically looking at the broader focus of what would be the, the key benefits that might be realized by um, having access to you know sort of the, the broader categories of information so um, so we see that, uh, yeah, so it, uh, understanding the emission sources is a, as a critical value proposition. Um, we see there as the second two uh, top priorities beyond that of engaging the community and in developing strategy. Um, these were good to see up there because we actually uh, sort of intuitively felt that like these were the primary value propositions of the information. So engaging the community, um, we sort of categorize into a comms exercise. So it was a way of, um, Sort of uh, using using the information in a way of improving engagement um, with with the idea of, of pulling in new stakeholders, pulling in better understanding or common understanding. Um, to develop strategy is a different sphere of work, um, so it's um, there's uh, like using these data points as a way of building strategy is basically um, where you sort of interrogating the information, you're trying to understand how, what are the specifics of municipality. Um, and uh, should that be, should those specifics be informing the type of projects that we pursue or um, sort of the areas that we look to take action in? Um, so to see both of those sort of key spheres of activity that, you know, really like some of the, the principal value propositions of this type of work, it was good to see. And, uh, and then, so taking a look at some of the other options, what we see is really that um, at this stage, utilizing this information as a way of um, better understanding how this compares with other communities or better engaging with other communities was not considered a top priority, um, which is, uh, you know, sort of an interesting um, output for this and something that we're, um, that will certainly be informing the, the first steps of this project. But um, also I'm quite interested because this is, for coming from our work with local government, we found that, um, the, it's really um, interest taking a look at it and trying to get your heads around it. But then once um, sort of the channels to that and the, the information paths around that become a bit clearer, then sort of there's a bit more of a heads up looking around what is everyone else doing? How do we understand this and connect with other groups and like? So we'll see if this is, you know, that's potentially a direction that'll go in, in time. So, um, so this is taking a look at a bit more of a sector, sector or segmented um, approach to like what this, um, these data sets might be. What we see is that um, transport and stationary energy emissions, particularly electricity, are actually um, sort of the key focus areas. Um, sort of, uh, as we'll see in a bit, in a moment, a step or two, like some of the um, less um, significant areas of activity, you know, sort of with, on the residential side, such as uh, sort of waste, land use, industri industry, lower priority. But overall, what we see in general is that um, it's the data sources themselves, the data sets themselves that are really um, considered to be core. Additional functions and features of the website were not considered to be uh, as significant a priority for this. And so, um, yeah, and so that reinforces what Imogen was saying in regards to like, uh, it's actually the the real gap being identified here is just in the in the essentially the data itself the, you know the the core data metrics 
So the um, this slide here is looking specifically into that data and some some you know some further segmentation of that, looking at stationary energy in particular because this was highlighted as a as a key area of interest. Um, Again, what this is doing, what the survey results have allowed us to sort of understand like where this prioritization takes effect. Um, we're seeing really the focus is, um, is there's cost. Cost is a, is a critical metric. Um, there's uh, a strong focus on electricity, on renewables. Um, we see that gas usage, gas costs, gas um, consumption and emissions is, um, is very much down the list in regards to sort of as a priority. And so, um, and so all of this is just going into informing uh, what we see as like being sort of the, the key visuals and data points to be presented on. So uh, there were a few other insights from the survey, but that was really the, the key ones. Um, and we're very happy to take questions and sort of expand through that in more detail as needed. Um, just, I'm just gonna quickly step through the GPC and what it is. Um, so uh, the Global Protocol for Community-Based Emissions Reporting um, is a standard, so it's, there's a few bits and pieces of it. So the, the core piece is a framework. So it's basically a way of understanding what should be included in regards to when we talk about a community emissions. One of the type of methods that are considered acceptable for, for inclusion, so it's, um, and, and, a, and a method it says essentially is it's a, it's a type of data and then it's a way that the data is then converted into emissions and then it's a way that those emissions are sort of um, corrected for things such as time and space scaling. And so that's what the framework is. And then within that framework, there are several standards. So um, I'll talk about the standards in a couple of slides, but basically the standard are essentially a way of interpreting, uh, so we'll go back to that, that first slide, I'll just I'll quickly brush. Um, wrap up. So um, GPC is currently basically establishing itself as the, the framework and standard used internationally for how community emissions are reported. There are several others that exist and there's a number of others that sort of predate this significantly. Where GPC is really good is that and, and why it's sort of becoming so popular is that it's been specifically tailored for cities um, for local government, for sub-regional governments to be able to build up inventories of their um, of their uh, their municipal emissions. So that means it's got several features that make it um, easier for the municipalities to do this, and that in particular are centered around creating a sort of a stackable type of solution. So that means like the um, when you build a GPC compliant inventory, the basic protocol, that means you can simply and easily add to say an adjacent um, region's inventory. They're all designed to fit together and, and to aggregate quite easily to facilitate comparison and the like. So because of that strong focus on those sort of, uti that utility of the, the protocol, like the, the intent of it, it's been, it's been really rapidly adopted. Um, in our studies, we've indicated like the adoption rate is currently like something like 30% plus of, uh, uh, municipalities across Australia are either have a GPC protocol or are adopting one, you know, and it's like within the last 12 to 20 months. So the rate of uptake is really quick, and we're going to see, and essentially, it's going to be the same. And obviously, we've got all these international bodies backing it. So, just yeah. a little bit more of the detail some of the reasons why it's becoming so popular is because it's got a really robust framework for um, the accounting principles. So, it starts out by so uh, relevance, so that means that it's uh, emissions that apply to the municipality, completeness to make sure that there's no gaps or issues with it, consistency, so that means it's being, it's establishing methods that report reliably over time, transparency, so that means all of the reporting methods and data sets are made uh, publicly available, and accuracy, obviously, is, is, a, is a requirement. The, the way that it's structured, however, makes it a very approachable protocol, and so that means Types, you know, both from you know, sort of the you know, major cities, which can do really any standard they choose, uh, down to like very small regional governments can um, develop, you know, when the methods are applied correctly, can develop compliant um, emissions profiles in cost effective ways. 
So just briefly for those who are a bit less familiar with how um, these sort of emissions profiles are developed. So that we basically establish boundaries. They can be physical to say territorial boundaries, or they can be sort of conceptual as in like identifying generation sources and like. Um, all carbon emissions is measured in scopes. Um, broadly, um, there is scope one and three. Scope one means the emissions come from within the boundary that you're considering. Scope three means they come from without, but, but are incurred through activity within the boundary. Um, and then scope two is just a special case, scope three, that uh, refers specifically to electricity and a couple of the minor things that I won't worry about because it's it a bit too complicated. Um, when we talk about the profiles that we're doing, so obviously we're using GPC, we use what is they refer to as their basic categorization. So basic incorporates stationary energy, transport, and waste. Um, there are there is also their basic plus category, which is um, includes AFL use, so agriculture, forestry, and other land use, and industrial processes and product use. So and I know Michael's probably going to have some comments about that, but um, so. Uh, it's not that they're, um, they will never be included, it's just they're not currently included in this iteration, uh, in this version of data sets. We're in the process of rapidly bringing on the complete basic plus method uh, for councils, and it will be something to explore for a future for bringing it on for this community portal. Um, as we can see here uh, in the right hand side uh, of this slide, um, basic covers essentially, well, what is amount at this stage, about 84% of Australia's emission. Uh, Basic Plus covers essentially the remainder. There are some very trivial categories which aren't included in that. And, and this here itself is actually a, um, itself not necessarily a, a completely universal means of accounting. It's simply the, um, the standard that the Australian government's applying um, based on the, uh, the systems coming out of the IPCC. So, um, but basic plus is, basic is a, is a very good starting point for uh, building emissions profiles. So the final thing I was gonna to touch upon here is that um, through this portal, we're talking about some of the options in regards to how to present the information. Um, we're really interested in um, this being an accessible and uh, a tool that's, you know, that, that becomes available to all communities. Um, but at the same time, we also are sustainable solutions, so one that can um, continue to operate, continue to um, you know, be updated and, and managed and expanded. So to that end, we're looking at uh, creating a, a simple and complex type reporting with the idea that simple uh, reporting will be freely available and complex reporting will have a nominal fee associated with it. So, um, we're basically looking to get a balance in between uh, making sure that communities that um, have a very low on resource but would like the data to be able to take initial steps will have the type of data that's useful to them made available. Um, and then community groups that are a bit better resourced that are looking for, say, you know, more developed business cases and you know, more comprehensive data sets can access the more complex reporting. Here is just an example about you know, some of the categorization type representations. Um, we're still ironing out exactly what will be in these reports for, for either of them. Um, and so we're definitely still interested in taking some feedback about what would be um, useful in that regard. Cool. And so that's, that'll wrap up my contribution. Great, so we'll, we'll move to Michael and we'll put um, questions at the end there, but I've already got a few questions cropping up. And, and um, if you're listening in, please, uh, Find the Q&A panel and start typing in your questions. Uh, over to you, Michael. You'll have to turn your sound off, on. <laughs> yeah, thanks for telling me that, Heather. I was just about to start speaking while muted. Um, so uh, I, haven't, I didn't think I had any slides, but here, here, here we go. Uh, since I've been at Beyond Zero Emissions, I'm head of research. I've been looking at the industrial sector or emissions from manufacturing. Uh, the first uh, report I was involved in uh, was issued last year and it was about the cement sector. So not a, a everybody's favorite uh, topic, but it is cement, the making of cement is 8% of world emissions, which is about the same as all cars on the planet. So it is really important uh, sector to, to tackle. And 
you know, by and large, if, if it ever gets mentioned, it's usually to say, oh, there's nothing we can do about cement emissions because they're really difficult. But we showed in that report that uh, certainly in the Australian context, we can eliminate emissions even from the cement sector and show the rest of the world how to do that. Uh, just last month, we uh, launched our next report on manufacturing and industry, which is called Electrifying Industry. And this deals with the emissions from manufacturers that are take place in the factory. Um, so um, if we use the, uh, as Matt just explained, the scope, the scope one, two, three um, type idea, these are scope one emissions from a factory related to heat. Uh, and the normal, um, you know, anything from glass to plastic to metal to textiles to food is they burn fossil fuels. So it doesn't matter how many wind turbines and uh, solar panels we build in Australia, unless we do something about these in factory emissions, unless we change the processes, they'll still be occurring. And uh, again, it's something that not a lot of people have tackled. They seem to go under the radar. Um, not many people these days have even been in a factory, let alone work in one. Uh, but, it, but it's a significant source of emissions, about 8% of Australia's emissions, more globally, more like 12%. Uh, so we showed that one way, uh, probably the biggest way to stop burning fossil fuels within a factory is to use renewable electricity uh, in the processes and it's quite a fat report to, as to show how you actually do that how you go from it's normally gas to electricity uh, in, it often involves changing the, the process of making whatever it is um, quite fundamentally but the exciting thing is that in the process not only do you eliminate emissions if you use renewable electricity uh, but you can reduce energy costs you can speed up production um, you can produce a better product. There's a there's a whole load of benefits, and um, it's uh, it's an exciting opportunity for Australia to grasp uh, if we choose to do so, and if the politicians give the manufacturers the incentives to fuel switch to renewable electricity. Uh, so the next slide, I think. Look at that. Oh yeah, there's the cement. So <laughs> that's the cement one. I've I've spoken about that. But basically, the solutions were um, uh, quickly using alternative cements, using and using less cements. In a nutshell, that's what it was. And one way of using less cement. Cement, by the way, is the binder in concrete. But most of the emissions in concrete come from cement. One way of using less cement and concrete is to uh, is to use more wood. So to build with timber, and we're starting to see that, but we could build a lot more with timber. And uh, when done sustainably and well, uh, it's actually a way of sequestering carbon in our cities. And so our cities become carbon sinks because they're, they're made out of wood. Uh, so next slide. Oh, so that's your last one, Michael. That's my last one. So what I do want to say is that uh, we've probably we've almost come to the end of the big um, pieces of research that we're going to do. We've covered all sectors. There are a few couple of outstanding areas, but our plan where we're taking it next is that in a way we're merging the research stream with the community's work um, to do uh, uh, more repowering reports. So along the lines of that repowering Port Augusta report that we were talking about earlier. A community and that could be a town or a larger a larger region or you know even a state or territory and saying what makes what are the really big emissions reductions projects that make sense for this area not just to reduce emissions but make sense in terms of grasping all the economic opportunities of the zero carbon era so we are producing a report for the northern territory which is really important because at the moment, the big idea to drive the economy in the Northern Territory is to um, access the shale gas. And that is a huge carbon bomb, bigger than the Adani coal mine. And if, if we start to frack that in earnest, that, that's a big problem. So we wanna show that uh, Northern Territory has other options um, related to the renewable energy and the other resources they've got there. Um, and then, we are going to produce uh, a report uh, for 
uh, Collie in Southwest Australia, which similarly to Port Augusta has an old coal fired power station. So we'll be looking at that area and saying, you know, what makes sense for Collie? Um, you know, what opportunities does Collie have in the zero carbon era? So, and it's not just producing a report, but uh, engaging the community and, and really trying to start a local campaign and a groundswell of you know excitement uh, uh, about about the things that can be done and I think that's really important um, I gave a talk at Collie uh, a couple of months back and we were picketed by um, the coal miners and a little bit later the local government turned around on its commitment to put through solar panels through their community buildings and said no that's not the right thing to do so there seems to be a real tension. Um, there's no need for these communities to lose the pride they have in the role that they've played as massive energy producers, but they do need to orient it towards clean energy, I guess. And we're seeing that in Port Augusta now. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know you um, had that. I didn't know you had that experience in Collie, Heather. It'd be great to talk about that. Um, I was I was reading today about how the Spanish government. Other people might have seen this that um, is planning to transition every single job in coal mining in the next few years into a renewables job. And so they're saying we, we are going to end coal mining in Spain, but every, every one of you um, can have a job uh, in, in the new industry and we're going to provide uh, training and methods for you to, to transition. And that's the kind of um, project that we need here. And governments haven't been great at transitioning our communities so far. So um, I'm really interested in your work in industry because uh, in Germany and Japan, they um, have actually shielded their industrial sector from the costs of energy transition. Highly, Those cultures are really built on those. Yeah. And I, I just wonder, how, in your work with how our industries have to transition, which is, uh, involves fundamental change, and these are the deliverers of all of our jobs, yeah. how do you see them reorienting around um, renewable energy? Will they have to operate at different times? Will they be the first out the gates to, to soak up all of our cheap solar that we're going to have in the middle of the day? You know, Do you see some fundamental changes in our relationship with industry happening here? I don't see fundamental changes in their, uh, their energy, their patterns of energy use, no, um, because I think in a 100% renewable grid we'll be able to produce, uh, you know, supply electricity when it's required through, you know, combination of storage and demand management and other things. Um, what it needs is more fundamental changes in the way things are made. Uh, if you look at most the way most things are made, I don't know, you take paper, for example, or glass, there's usually about 100 years of tradition, um, you know, more for something like bricks, you know, more several thousand years, uh, where basically they've been made the same way. And we need to start making them in a, a different way. And, and we know what those ways are, um, but it still re requires investment from, uh, from industry. And that is very wise investment because it will stand them in good stead for the zero carbon future and reduce exposure to, to, climb, uh, to um, carbon policies. But uh, the, the money needs to come from somewhere. Um, you know, big organizations can afford it probably. Australia's got a lot of small scale manufacturers compared to Germany and Japan. Um, so that they need some government uh, support um, just to make their sort of payback periods a little less and to, to help them with the investment. And if we use that idea to come back to understanding how your emissions are caused in the first place, Matt, in your work, there's always a tension between accuracy and cost, right? So are there some really simple things um, that your tool can produce cheaply for communities to get that information rolling? And do you always run the danger of sacrificing um, Good information. I, I'd say inaccurate information or information that's plus or minus five percent accurate can still be good information if it tells the right story. Uh, that's actually a really interesting observation. So the level of accuracy in the work that um, sort of in the development of emissions profiles is a a topic of discussion. Um, from our perspective, we say that's um, 
uh, information, the data only needs to be as accurate as the decision that it influences. And so if it's the case, Uh, to a certain point that means you make a decision A versus decision B and the I guess the cost of making the wrong decision under that circumstances really tells you what the accuracy that your requirements are. So one thing that we find in general is that um, there is uh, often a lot of problems in the way people approach things like community uh, like emissions inventories and the like because they both um, get very preoccupied with having a highly accurate profile, but at the same time, don't really have any intentions for how it's going to be applied. So we, um, which really creates a recipe for a, um, a very cost ineffective approach towards doing this type of work. So some of the stuff like that we are doing is, is, has been very much about like, how do you have a sensible like outcomes based approach towards the accuracy requirements? How do you connect through from uh, emissions inventories um, through to um, sort of like direct interventions into the community. Um, and some of the key messaging that we do in that regard is basically that um, it's okay to sort of iterate your accuracy over time. Like, so as you, as you get more and more sure about what it is that you're doing and what the point of your exercise is and you expand the scope and scale of the type of interventions you're doing, um, then, then you should increase the accuracy and the confidence of your data set proportionally, right? But you shouldn't come into the situation preemptively thinking that the only way you can even consider taking the first step is by having an, you know, an emissions profile for all sectors and sources down to like a plus or minus 1%. That's not a, that's not a sensible way to approach the data. So I've got some more questions about data, but I think it's probably important at this stage that we talk about how this tool's going to be delivered, the image and end map. You know, have you looked at your business model? Um, are you going to charge councils? Or what are you going to do for community groups? Um, what's your, your gut plan about how this might work? Uh, Imogen, you'll have to turn your sound off uh, on. <laughs> Oh, we can't hear you. Can you hear us? Uh, I could answer if Imogen. There. It's, I can. It's, yeah, I can read a lips. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here you go. Sorry. I got you on. Um, it's probably a great sound, but I'll just be brief. Um, we really want this tool to be available to any community, individual, and or group. Yeah. Um, communities to fully to trying to figure out what the process and the profiles themselves because it's a really steep learning curve and um, it can just be done much more efficiently. I feel expertise in this and people like myself who understand how communities use this to make decisions. Um, the resource is up that community time to, to be used in much more productive ways. I will get better over time. These will not be perfect um, by any means. But they need to be. Um, they need to be an indication of options of that in the community. And they need to be used as a tool to use the targets and as a tool to figure out what other major strategies these and councils and state governments and federal governments could use to actually eliminate the emissions in that particular area. That's what our intention is around how they're used. Um, we'd like to see them kickstart a whole range of zero carbon communities and range of sectors. Um, and, and ideally they'll be updated annually so that you can get a new report either whether you're tracking in the right direction or not. And as the data improves, those decision making capabilities will also improve. And all the knowledge improves their decision making capacity will also improve. Matt, uh, what, what can you add to that? Sure, I um, 100% agree with where Imogen is saying. Like it's, uh, we're very interested in this becoming um, a universally accepted uh, tool. 
one thing that is, you know, that community groups should feel comfortable and confident about is that um, this is the same data that's being used in, by local government and by increasingly state government um, for knowledge about um, how these, uh, you know, what's going on in, in communities. So it's um, one of the things that's happening at the moment is that there's an increasing amount of learning going on in regards to what constitutes effective ways of understanding data. And so that means uh, continuing to iterate improvements about visualizations and um, like the particular, I guess, like with data sets of this complexity, there's many different ways to sort of slice and dice the information to connect it through to relative metrics. Um, and so this is going to continue to be part of our learning. We're going to land on a particular solution for um, this uh, uh, sort of portal and these reports um, within the scope of this project. But we are very much hoping that we'll be able to keep this as a sort of a dynamic and live solution. Brilliant. And what's your timing on delivering this tool? So we now for the brief and then so we'll be going out through the development process um, through the closing you know months of this year and um, so we'll be looking sort of in the you know startish period of next year we'll be finalizing the specific dates of when this should go live sounds fantastic Michael um, tell me a little bit about the volunteers at BZE like sending volunteers to do um, the the checking of council website sounds like an enormous task so you must have a bit of an army um that you can access there who are they and 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 um how, how are you going with that oh and we've got our first q a so tune in there and we'll work out who answers the question what work are you doing in this space with church communities and synods that's a really interesting idea uh go for it michael uh, yeah, so uh, Imogen is the one who's found uh, volunteers to check uh, council websites, but uh, we get volunteers in a number of ways. We put uh, adverts on our website uh, with ethicaljobs.com. We go directly to universities and find volunteers who just want some work experience or a more f formal internship. Um, we've got a vol volunteer base going from way back. and. Um, some volunteers just sort of turn up. I don't really know where they're from, but uh, but it's great that they. <laughs> um, so one good thing is it's uh, it's not actually that hard to find uh, volunteers. It's sometimes hard for um, to find volunteers to stick around for that long, especially when they're young and you know they're looking for a job or they have lots of other things going on. Um, but uh, yeah, we're very we're very lucky to have. Um, a wide range of volunteers doing our research, our administration. We produce two radio shows a week, which is all volunteers. We um, we have a discussion group once a month. That's all volunteer done. So yeah, we run stalls, again volunteers. So um, yeah, it's one great thing about Beyond Zero Emissions. Imogen? Yeah. Often we have volunteers on projects, and we often recruit um, volunteers for those particular projects. In the in the instance of the website review, we probably recruited about twenty volunteers and had two or three people, also volunteers, coordinating that work. Um, so we we wouldn't have been able to do it without their input, and we really appreciate the time and effort that they provide because. And, and if you reflect on church communities and communities of faith, I mean, we're, we're moving between regions and communities of interest. But of course, so many people do connect around a community of interest. Um, have you have you had yeah. much experience of doing your zero? This particular issue earlier this year, um, we were approached by some people in the ACT who were keen to do a zero and carbon communities project around all of the religious organisations in the ACT. Um, but they did a bit of sort of pre-work and kind of felt that the community wasn't quite ready for it yet. Um, but I think that it's, I think it would be a really great opportunity. Um, and looking at sectors like the health sector, the aged care sector, 
churches. So we have like enormous networks of groups who are communities in a different kind of sense to a physically located community. There's also opportunities to do work in that kind of space as well. And, and this comes back to the global protocol and how you manage um, to look at emissions from the sort of usage. Uh, if I take the um, Australian um, emissions reporting, they, they have done it in the past by economic sectors, so they, they've grappled with some of those. Matt, is your tool um, able to, to look at the end use sectors or the end use communities, like the example of church communities? So we are looking at a bunch of different ways to introduce dimensioning. So essentially um, ways of establishing reasonable attributions um, and that if there's like um, qualities by which we can um, ensure that the segregation of the data is done um, in a way that's consistent. So as in like so we can ensure that the, the breakdown of the data remains summing to the same whole. Uh, and, it, and it's a reliable data set. We're always interested in exploring those. Like um, one thing that we've been doing is um, getting, uh, so at the moment we're connecting through the emissions profiles and, and the segregations, of, the segmentations of those emissions um, directly through to actions. And we, we're actually looking at BZE and some of the research done there as, a, as a, the data sets to build this. Um, and that's, and that segmentation is actually a really great way to um, improve attributability of actions but as an interesting side effect of that it's it allows us to essentially create tailored pictures for specific groups right and so like um, doing that for communities would be a very possible thing um, yeah so if there was a way of establishing some sort of commonality or, or some sort of metric that would allow for us to do a reasonable apportionment then that would be a, it. Would be a candidate, yeah. Oh, I'm well. One thing at a time, and I struggle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are coming to the to the end of our time, so I'm just going to go through to leave with our listeners. Michael, can I start with you? <laughs> oh, do you have to? <laughs> um. <laughs> um can I see whether Matt or Imogen have a thought and then they give me a chance to think? Well, my thought Certainly. is that, Imogen? Uh, I'm, Oh, sorry, Imogen. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, you can go first, Matt, if you like. Well, my thought is that um, we, we very much hope for, if there's uh, just any, any thoughts or contributions or ideas um, about uh, information applications or things that we definitely should or shouldn't have, um, that would be, would be all ears. Um, and I was hoping to have a registration process ready for tonight for our website so that you could register your interest and we'll let you know when the profiles are ready for testing or ready for um, access. Um, it's not ready yet, but it should be up tomorrow morning. So if you have a look at the Zero Carbon Communities website or the BZ website tomorrow morning, if you're interested in keeping track of where this project's going, um, please add your information there. And uh, I might just comment that I will make sure I send those links around to people, Imogen, so, so please give them to me and I'll, I'll make sure everyone gets them. Yep, Michael? Yeah, uh, well, a request for information from me as well. Um, if, if anyone has a, a, an understanding of the Northern Territory or Collie, uh, where we're doing our first reports, in Melbourne, I feel a very long way from both of those places. Um, either from a kind of community point of view or industry or renewable energy, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing from you. Um, and one more, one more for me too. Um, if you have a project that would reduce emissions in your local community and that you um, think might be ready for business case development, we'd also be interested in getting in touch because we're looking at trying to set up some pro bono business case development to get projects ready for investors to make decisions around um, in the next 12 months. So let us know Brilliant. about that too. 
Okay, so I will wind us up there. Um, the uh, recording will go up on the web and I will send things round to people. And if you like our work, you are most welcome to donate to the Coalition for Community Energy and that's part of um, our information set as well. Thank you so much to all of our speakers and um, we will um, see you soon. And good luck with all the work. Thank you. Bye. And I will end the meeting. Bye, everyone.